see you all here for the building an inclusive volunteer team webinar. And that's a message to let us know that the meeting is being recorded. So we just gone past seven o'clock, so I'm going to get started. And before we do, I will just go through that final bit of housekeeping in case anybody has missed it. So if you've got any technical problems during the next um, hour, then do let us know in the chat. We've got Alex on hand, who is a technical genius and will be able to support. And if all else fails, use the classic IT trick of leaving and coming back and hopefully everything will be sorted. If you have got any questions throughout the webinar, do let us know by the chat function. And as a reminder, this can be found in the bottom right normally. We'll do our best to answer these either as we're going through, but we'll also have some time at the end as well if there's any other questions that you want to ask. Just as a reminder, and just as you've probably heard the message say, we are recording this, so you will get a copy of the recording afterwards. And please do feel free to share it with other people and please feel free to pass it on to others who have been unable to attend tonight, as I appreciate that a number of rugby clubs have got sessions taking place. End time, I know it's an incredibly busy time at the minute, so we will make sure that we are finished by 8 p.m. And we'll also give some time to answer any of those questions. So the webinar itself will probably take place over the next 45 minutes or so. So with that in mind, let's get started. So this session tonight will provide an introduction to the inclusive volunteer recruitment toolkit that we have recently developed. And it'll give a feel for why it's been developed, how it can hopefully help you, the type of content included in the toolkit, and we'll all also hear from a club on how they have approached volunteer recruitment and the success that they've had. We'll also ensure that following this tool, uh, webinar, sorry, you know how to access the toolkit, should it be of interest and should you think there's things in there that will be helpful for you. So before I get going, um, I'd just like to say a big thank you, first of all, to the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group and also a club and CB subcommittee group who we've been working really closely with on the development of this toolkit. And I believe that there's a couple of members with us tonight. So just a big thank you, first of all, to those two groups. So who have we got on tonight's call? So if I can ask Rachel and Paul to turn their cameras on. Um, just a quick introduction from me, first of all. So I'm Stephanie Allmark, volunteer manager at the RFU. Um, I started earlier this year and I have been leading on the development of this toolkit that we're going to be running through on tonight's webinar. We've also got Rachel from Rock Corps, who we've worked with on this project and who will be providing an overview of some of the key themes that came out of these listening workshops that we held at the start of the process and how this helped to shape the toolkit. And just um, for information, Rock Corps work with organisations to help design and implement volunteer strategies and they've got a lot of experience in engaging, supporting and inspiring underrepresented communities. And then we've also got Paul from Otley, who are one of the clubs that feature in our toolkit. And he will be talking about how they've recruited um, a significant number of volunteers to support with the development of the club. So I'm sure that there'll be a lot of interest in that section when Paul delivers later on tonight. And then behind the scenes, we have also got Alex Thompson from the RFU, and he will be making sure it all runs accordingly, it all runs to plan, and he'll also be helping to introduce the polls and raise any questions at the end of the webinar. So moving on to why an inclusive volunteer recruitment toolkit. So our ambition is for rugby union to reflect the diversity of the society that we live in. And this is at all levels, from professional to the grassroots and from players to volunteers and spectators. We want to improve diversity and continue to create an inclusive environment. And ultimately, we want to ensure that rugby is a game of opportunity where all will receive a warm welcome, regardless of background or experience. So to help achieve this, diversity and inclusion is one of the four driving objectives for the RFU strategy. And to support this, we've developed a diversity and inclusion action plan. And Alex will be able to put a link to where this can be found in the chat so that if you did want to go and have a look at this in a little more detail after the webinar, you can do. So following some in-depth research, this plan focuses on four key areas of the game. So gameplay, which is players, coaches, match officials, fans, followers and partners, employees and board, and then also game leadership. And this is volunteer leaders such as yourselves within clubs, constituent bodies and also council. 
So to support the game leadership area, a working with group was set up and they developed a number of recommendations. And one of these was to produce a toolkit to support inclusive volunteer recruitment at clubs and CBs. And this is what we're going to be talking through in a little bit more detail tonight. So considering that recommendation, we are now going to go on to the first poll and I will hand over to Alex to introduce and launch this. Thanks, Steph. I've just launched that poll, so that should be with you now. And the question is, does your club have enough volunteers? Yes or no? Um, if for some reason you can't see the uh, uh, poll for some reason, please put it in the chat. So that's the sort of backup. If you haven't found, uh, if it hasn't popped up for you, add it into the chat, yes or no. Uh, so I can see the last few are just going to put uh, in now, just giving you the last few seconds to, to answer what uh, uh, you think yeah does your club have enough volunteers yes or no and so i'm going to close that poll now and share those results with you so does your club have enough volunteers well resoundedly you know 90 percent to say no and 10 percent uh, yes so uh, steph i think they're in the right place for this workshop Yes, there is definitely are. Um, so based on the responses, um, we know recruitment of volunteers can be a challenge. And perhaps now more than ever, with the return to rugby after the pandemic and the additional things that need to be considered, and also people's um, potentially concerns about returning to volunteering. So considering recruitment from diversity and inclusion perspective, could be seen as an additional challenge to what's already being faced, but actually it reflects good volunteer recruitment principles. And we know that there's a number of benefits linked to ensuring that the club is providing that inclusive volunteer experience. And especially when we are talking about the recruitment of new volunteers. So having a group of volunteers at your club made up of people who reflect the community with diverse backgrounds, experiences, skills and perspectives is incredibly valuable. And we know that a variety of diverse perspectives brings new ways of doing things, it opens up new ideas and opportunities for club growth, and it can help increase efficiency and impact. Ultimately, the more inclusive volunteering is, the more it's going to encourage new people to want to join and to help out. And we also know that increasing diversity isn't about replacing one set of volunteers with another, it's about creating the conditions for people to feel included, welcomed, and more likely to consider volunteering and reaching out beyond those already engaged to see whether there is a new audience that can help support what you're doing and help support with sustainability of the club. So this brings us on to our next poll and I will hand back to Alex to introduce and launch this. So I've just launched that poll for you now. So does your club think about how inclusive your volunteer experience is? Uh, no, it's not really on the radar. Uh, we think about it every now and then, or yes, it's embedded in what we do. That's over to you now. As I said, if you uh, don't see it for any reason, you should see the, the slide on the screen and add it to the chat if you haven't. Uh, that poll has not popped up for some reason. So I can see all the answers are coming in now. It's actually pretty close at the moment. So get uh, your answers in. Uh, I'm just going to give it a final little bit of time. Um, as the last ones sort of come in now. So I'm going to end the poll here and share those results with you. So, uh, you know, the, the, the one that's come out the most, we think about it every now and then, you know. Um, and there's a few that have got it embedded. Uh, and, of course, you know, there's in between that, there's uh, no, it's not really on the radar. It hasn't been at all um, with 37%. So I'll stop sharing that one. Over to you, Steph. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Um, and probably to be expected, and, and hopefully whichever option you selected, there will be something within tonight's session and also within the toolkit, which will be of interest and help with regards to your approach to volunteer recruitment and also just thinking about how inclusive that volunteer experience is. So with that in mind, I'm just going to hand over to Rachel now to give a little bit more information on the development of the resource. 
Thanks, Steph. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a quick overview of how we developed the resources. Um, so firstly, it was really, really important that we take what we call a volunteer first approach. So that means we spent a lot of time talking to volunteers in clubs and CBs and really working to understand their needs and their challenges in this area. Um, ultimately, we wanted to develop resources that were actually going to be useful for you and meet some challenges um, that you have on a day to day basis. So to do that, we held a number of listening sessions where we spoke with club and CB representatives. Um, some of you may have actually been involved in those. Um, so through those sessions, what we did was we asked those participants to share their key challenges and also their successes when thinking about inclusive practices in volunteering. And we asked all those participants to consider every aspect of the volunteer journey um, using the volunteer framework that you can see on the screen right now. Um, and we just wanted to kind of draw attention to this framework because it's really important to look at the whole journey and um, understand that inclusive practices run through every single aspect of a volunteer's experience. Um, we know that recruitment is a massive challenge for many, many clubs and CBs, well, 90% of you. Um, but at the same time, it's also important that we're considering how inclusive our training is, how we're working to retain and reward volunteers, and how we're using the success stories um, to then spread the word further and inspire more people to join in with volunteering. Um, you know, and we need to make sure that once we have recruited people in, that we're continuing to work to ensure that all those volunteers continue to feel included. So you will find some more detail in the resources um, if you check those out about the volunteer framework and how you can use it as a tool to think about inclusive practices at your club or CB. So the outcome of those listening sessions was that we were able to really identify lots of themes and challenges that were important to you, the volunteers, and this meant that we could then develop resources that really directly addressed some of the challenges that you raised. So as you can see on the screen now, um, there were a number of key themes which were highlighted in those sessions, which really helped us to refine the focus of the toolkit. Um, so I'll just talk through a few of those so you have a bit of the background um, to the resources. So firstly, one theme that came up was, well, what, what do we mean by inclusivity? Um, what do we mean when we talk about being inclusive? What are the benefits of it? What does an inclusive club look like? The next theme was around, and this came out very strongly um, through the listening sessions, was centred around confidence. Um, there, was, there was quite a bit of concern that... Um, that volunteers didn't feel confident when talking about diversity and inclusion. They were really concerned of making mistakes around use of language. What if I inadvertently offend someone? Um, and that this in turn was kind of holding them back from exploring this area further. Um, lots of participants in those sessions um, asked around, um, okay, how do we show people who aren't already involved in rugby that they're welcome and that it could be a sport for them and that they're welcome to come into our volunteering group? Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of the participants talked about um, this idea that to volunteer, you either need to already love rugby or be the parent of a child who is playing rugby and that sometimes volunteering can be seen as a really set journey. So there were, there were a lot of questions about, OK, well, how else can we communicate? How can we raise awareness of opportunities to audiences who are, who are currently outside of rugby and encourage them to get involved and help out? Um, 
Another theme, and, and these are all kind of slightly related, the, these last couple really, um, was around, okay, well, how do we get that message out beyond our existing group? Because um, there were a lot of um, recognition that, that often we talk to the same people when we're looking to recruit new volunteers, we're sending out the same message, but perhaps to our existing membership in our existing Facebook group. And there's a real desire to understand, OK, well, what how how do I get that message further? How do I target and communicate with some new audiences? Um, and allied to this was, again, how to go about building relationships within the wider community. So, for example, with other community community groups or sections of the community not traditionally involved within rugby so this kind of extended from how to actually engage with members of the community in the first place to how to develop an understanding of of the needs and the culture of different groups and how the rugby and volunteering offer can then be tailored accordingly so that that is more inclusive and then finally, um, we heard a really strong call for best practice and a desire for clubs and CBs to really learn from and support each other. Um, we know there is some, some really great work already going on out there. You will hear um, a couple of case studies today um, and, um, and you will see in the resources, we also have brought to life a number of case studies. Um, and this is really about ensuring that we are engaging with people within the game who can be our role models and so that people can see themselves within volunteering at all levels. So that's just a quick overview of um, the process we've been through since March um, to reach the resources that you will be able to explore um, from today. So Steph, back to you. You're on mute. <laughs> There was always going to be one that did it and it had to be me. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, so from this, we developed a list of resources to hopefully address um, a large number of the themes that Rachel's just run through, recognising that everybody is at different stages with this. And I'll just run through each of these resources briefly before going into a little bit more detail and bringing into life some of that content. So as you can see on screen now, there is an introduction to diversity and inclusion resource, which outlines um, the ambition of the diversity and inclusion strategy raises awareness of the benefits of being inclusive and also includes a document which outlines the protected characteristics and gives suggestions of things that you can consider when thinking about engaging a wider audience and volunteering. We also have a number of how-to guides, so how to engage with your local community, which as Rachel mentioned came out as a really strong theme and it was one of the most common questions asked, so okay how do we start to do this and this resource provides a 10-step guide on things to consider. Making sure your marketing is inclusive, as this is the first port of call when people are looking to learn what an organisation is all about. So in this, we talk about recognising and showcasing volunteering and different voices and experiences and some examples of how this can be done. Support and inclusive conversations, which gives some things to consider from setting the context through to the importance of asking questions and then including more people in volunteering which really looks at how do we provide a range of different opportunities to get involved. So whether that's breaking down roles into simple tasks or simply use of language. So asking people to help out rather than necessarily volunteering. And then this is all brought together through the step by step action plan, which outlines five steps, which I will go on to in a little bit more detail later. So the next part of the webinar will go into each of these guides and provide an idea of context and also some so things to consider as a club. So that brings us nicely onto our next poll, which is linked to the Engage in Your Local Community Guide. So Alex, if I can hand back over to you to introduce that next poll, that'd be great. So this poll is with you now, it's launched. Uh, so where does your club look for new volunteers? Now this one's multiple choice. So you can click as many of these as uh, where you look for new volunteers so it might take a bit of time but actually you know what i mean you don't just click one you can click several on this one uh, so click all the ones that apply to your club and let's see what results we get on this um, and i can see they're coming in now uh, currently parents is in the lead 
Let's see if this changes. I'll just give a, a bit more time for people to do this one. Uh, parents is still in the lead at the moment. Uh, I don't think that's any surprise. So I'm going to finish it in just a moment. So if you want to finish off your or what you put in, um, and I'm going to end the poll now. So I'll share those results with you. And like I said, parents from the off really came out very strongly. Current players, ex-players, friends and family, and then sort of external ones, sort of very much a lower uh, scores are where they look for those. Uh, thanks, Steph. Brilliant. Thank you, Alex. So as we can see, the majority of responses focus around those already involved in the club. And this probably reflects what came out of the listening workshops. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the com most common questions asked was how can we start to engage with our local community? So the guide that we've developed talks about a 10 step approach, and I'll just run through that in a little bit more detail now. So you understand some of the content and see whether any of this might be of use when you're thinking about recruitment of volunteers within your club or constituent body. So the first is around understanding the makeup of your local community. So identifying schools, colleges, businesses near you that might offer programmes. So whether that's Duke of Edinburgh from a school perspective or staff volunteering days. Or you could ask local companies if your club or constituent body can be listed as a volunteer opportunity, either on their company intranet or bulletin board. Many companies offer these paid days for volunteering, but take up can be quite low. And that's because employees don't know where to go. So this provides a really good opportunity to get your message out there if you're looking to recruit volunteers. Understanding what groups your members and volunteers are part of separate to their interest in rugby. So a number of you might do this already through membership forms, but this can provide an introduction to a new group of people as well. And it can also help to understand what skills and experiences your members have. Using social media to see what's going on in the local community and also engage with some of these groups to see if you can support each other with the volunteering. One that I'm sure a lot of you have done, um, but setting up community focused events to provide people with an experience of what the club is all about for the first time. So an example of this is return to rugby, but it could also be outside of rugby. So car boot sales, open days, something which I'm sure a number of you have done. And it'd be really interesting to see if any of you on the call tonight have had any success with that. Great to drop it in the chat if you have. Um, an example of, of that that we've identified in the toolkit is Crawley, who have opened up their clubhouse for other sports groups and community groups. And this has really helped to build their wider relationship within the local community and has helped to develop and grow the club. A really simple one, but making the ask personal. So we know from research that a fifth of people say that the reason they don't volunteer is quite simply that they've not been asked. So just asking the question can sometimes re result in new volunteers. Having all of the right information on your website. So do you have a volunteer or recruitment section? And perhaps most importantly, keeping it up to date. So if somebody was to express an interest um, in volunteering via the website, would that go through to somebody that's then able to respond and let them know what the opportunities are? And also highlighting what club and volunteering can offer. So whether that's experience for a CV, developing skills or personal benefits, I think everyone knows on the call that volunteering has a massive impact on, on wellbeing, health and life satisfaction. Um, and that volunteers in sport are up to six times more likely than general volunteers to be motivated by the social benefits of volunteering. So meeting new people, making new friends, sharing experience. So is this is something that you as a club talk about when you are looking to recruit more volunteers. And finally, listing opportunities on local volunteer boards. And there's a link to how you can do this and find your local volunteer centre in the toolkit. And Alex will also be able to pop a link into the chat now should you want to have a look at this and find out where your local volunteer centre is and how you can link in with them as well. And an example um, of where that's worked quite well is uh, Bexley. So Bexley RFC um, had a shortage of volunteers at their club. So they reached out to their local volunteer centre and not only did they recruit several new volunteers, they were also able to access some additional support and guidance on how to support existing volunteers as well. So if you want to find out more about that, there's a link in the toolkit and also in the chat. So we know relationship building lies at the heart of engaging with your community. So this shouldn't necessarily be viewed as a one-off thing to do, but this guide will hopefully provide some steps and ideas 
which can be incorporated into some of the work that you're already doing. And completely appreciate that results won't necessarily be instant, but over time, you'll hopefully be able to build some great connections and see some new people getting involved in this. So in order to engage your community, your marketing and communications are also really important. And with that in mind, we will look to launch our next poll. So over to Alex. So that next poll is with you now. Uh, how easy is it for people to find out about volunteer opportunities at your club? Is it very easy or is it like a needle in a haystack? Let us know um, what you think. It's quite interesting how the results are coming through uh, so far. As I say, if you can't see it for any reason, any time that chat function, always put your uh, details into there or what you think. I'm just going to give it a last few seconds. Still a few just coming in now. And uh, see one just come into the chat. They've said a, a needle in the haystack. Um, so I'm going to end that poll now and share the results with you. Um, so unfortunately, you know, how easy is it for people to find out about volunteer opportunities at your club? You know, there's some as, you know, on the, the far end of the scale, like a needle in a haystack, and the majority of them are sort of hard, moderate, and only a few, unfortunately, are easy. So something for us to work on. Thanks, Alex. Really interesting. Um, and I think especially interesting when you consider that over a third of people that are looking for volunteer opportunities in sport online and on social media. So marketing materials are really crucial tools in ensuring that both existing and also prospective volunteers are aware of the opportunities that are out there. Um, this is the first port of call when people are looking to learn what you're all about and whether your club or your constituent body is somewhere that they'd like to, to get involved and volunteer. So it's really important that marketing and communication, wherever possible, can recognise and showcase the different people, voices and experiences that exist. Um, and I think by doing that, you can really help people both inside and outside of the club to feel represented and show it's a place to get involved. So the how-to guide that we have pulled together around um, the marketing and communications talks about some things which you can consider to ensure that your marketing is inclusive and also raises awareness of volunteering. Um, and I'll go through this in a little bit more detail now and put some questions out for you to consider. So the first in terms of reviewing your marketing materials, what subjects do you talk about the most? What images do you use? And how often do you actually talk about volunteers and volunteering in your marketing and communications? So if I was to go and Google the club and try to find out how to volunteer, would I be able to find this easily and would it engage me? So we know that attention spans can be quite short and people have got a lot of different things going on. So is it really easy to find out about that information? So a little task that might be worth doing after the webinar is imagining you're a new um, volunteer and you're thinking about getting involved at a club. If you visited your club website or the social media pages and tried to sign up, how easy is it? Was the information about how to get in touch really clear and were the opportunities easy to find? Asking members for feedback, so gathering feedback through a quick Facebook poll, somewhere to drop suggestions after a session, or just simply by asking people um, what they thought of the recent uh, marketing and communications that came out or what could be improved for next time might be quite useful. Planning a content calendar, so building key yearly moments into your plan. So this might be Volunteers Week, which takes place from the 1st to the 7th of June every year. And is a really good opportunity to amplify volunteering and to say thanks to any existing volunteers as well. It's easier to create varied content when you know what you want to focus on and when, especially across social media and email, um, you know when that is going to be. So for more information about using social media, you may have seen the webinar that we held earlier this year around engaging players, but there's also a lot of content that's relevant to engaging volunteers as well. So if you go into the RFU Club Support channel, you'll be able to find the webinar there. And then finally, asking people that aren't currently involved in the club for feedback. So whether this is through existing links that you have, so siblings or parents, or players, or whether you've got some links with um, local groups, and just ask if they'd be prepared to give a bit of feedback and in return, they might value your opinion on something. So just a simple question such as, would you know that you can get involved in volunteering from looking at any of our marketing and communications? 
or do you even know that actually our club is volunteer run? So another bit of research that's probably just worth touching on, and this was done a couple of years ago now, but it was found that one of the major challenges faced by sports clubs when recruiting volunteers was that over half of the public didn't realise that community sports clubs rely on and are ultimately run by volunteers. So it might just be worth thinking about, actually, is this something that we talk about in our marketing and communications? And do we reinforce this to members and wider? So coming on to the next how-to guide, a key element of marketing material is also the language that you use, which brings us on to our next poll quite nicely. So I will hand back to Alex again to launch the next one. Thanks, Steph. Uh, so this poll is with you now. Um, so we're sort of that talking. How confident do you feel about talking about diversity inclusion? Uh, very confident or all the way down to I avoid it. So select your answers there. Same rules apply as we've done in the other ones. There's uh, just one more poll after this. So you'll get a rest from me. Um, uh, great things coming in the chat. Please do keep them coming. Sharing the ideas is a big point of this uh, webinar this evening. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little bit more time for the final ones to come in on the poll. And uh, I'm going to end the poll there now. Share the results. So how confident do you feel about talking about diversity and inclusion? The main one that came out, I'll give it a try. Uh, there's some that I don't feel confident at all about it. Um, uh, but the main sort of two in the middle, I'll give it a try. And then some are, are confident about it. Steph? Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. And I think, again, that's probably um, to be expected based on some of the listening workshops as well. Um, and something that was identified around supporting conversations around diversity and inclusion with confidence can be um, a challenge that is faced when trying to build that more inclusive environment. So whether it's a general conversation about diversity and inclusion or a chat with someone whose experience or background might be different to your own, people can tend to hold back due to that lack of confidence. Um, but when creating that more inclusive experience, we know that the ability to support conversations is one of the most powerful tools available. And it's how we build support from those around you, create new relationships and ensure that volunteers feel welcomed and included. So some of the things to consider and that we've referenced in the toolkit is around context. So when you're having conversations around diversity and inclusion, think about setting the context so that people understand the wider purpose and intent behind some of the conversations that you will be having. Consideration, um, just considering and being aware of the potential for different lived experiences. Sounds really obvious, but in conversations, being able to recognize that your experience is not the only one that exists and to listen to, acknowledge, and just understand the experience of the person that you might be talking to. And that will help to ensure that people new to the club feel heard and recognized. And curiosity, again, something quite simple, but just taking that interest in people and getting to know them is a really important way to welcome volunteers into your club. Um, and I think asking questions can help to break the ice and also help to understand more about the other person's experience and background. And from a volunteer perspective, offer opportunities that are potentially matched to their skills or motivations and you know is something which they're going to enjoy. So East Dorset Dockers um, RFC has been built based on this inclusive club culture where all the members are represented and able to share their views and impact the direction of the club. And with the help of the club, we've pulled together a video to bring some of this to life. And this video is one of several that we've developed to bring to life some of the content that we've discussed tonight and it's in the toolkit um, and I won't show this now but I'll link to where these videos can be found is in the chat so that you can go away and have a look at these and see if any of this could be applied to your club as well. So the final how-to guide is around ensuring volunteering is inclusive and open and attractive to a wide pool of people. So we're hoping that some of the ideas in this guide will help you to think about how you can start to create volunteering opportunities that enable you to widen that pool of volunteers. So not just talking to parents or other people within the club, but talking to the wider community as well. If some of your key volunteer roles are already filled, brilliant. It will help to consider ways to include more people while still retaining your existing volunteers and help with that succession planning side. And if you're struggling more generally with recruiting volunteers, as the 90% have said, it might give a few ideas for how you can make it more appealing to new people or easier for them to say yes to. 
So we know from various research that many people would love to volunteer but can't fit that formal role into their lives due to other commitments. So does your club have a list of the small tasks that could suit someone who can only help out now and again? And when thinking about recruiting for more volunteers, do you think about frequency and format? So some tasks might need to be done once a year. Some might not need the same person to do them every week. And some might be suitable for doing online from home, especially now and after everything that we've gone through over the last 18 months. So is that made really clear in any role descriptions that you share or any volunteer recruitment campaigns that you're thinking about doing? So some questions to get you thinking on the screen now. So if you're thinking about recruiting for volunteers, do you think about if someone has an hour to give, what tasks would you be able to give them compared to someone that has a weekend, compared to someone that has 30 minutes? Does your club make a habit of regularly asking different people to help out, particularly with those small bite-sized tasks and how is that ask made? So as I said earlier, sometimes even using the term helping out can make it sound more appealing. And as more people experience helping out, the more likely it will be that they'll be open to doing so in the future. And if anybody have, has done any of these things that we're suggesting, it'd be great again to hear about that in the chat and hear about the outcomes and whether it was a success. So the other one was splitting roles. So there's not necessarily a reason for every committee role to be taken on by one person. So splitting a role in two, whether that's having a secretary and a vice secretary or splitting a women and girls coordinator role into maybe sponsorship, player recruitment and executive committee is a good way to create opportunities for more volunteers and match different people's skills and experience to different aspects of the role. And whilst we know that recruiting new volunteers can be a challenge, so you might be thinking, well, we can't even recruit one person, so how can we recruit two, three, four? You might find that by making that role less intense and more bite sized and more flexible, it actually becomes a more attractive proposition or easier for someone to commit to. So if you're doing this something again, which probably sounds really obvious, but having a generic email address, which multi users can access, can also help to split the workload. And an example of how this has been applied is at Westbury RFC, who have historically recruited one person per role. But as some of their older volunteers are stepping away, they're now looking to recruit teams to take on each role. So an example of how they've done this, they've moved from having one bar manager to recruiting two bar managers. Not only does that mean that the club have got cover if somebody's away or needs to take a weekend off or is busy doing something else, they've also found that the role was more attractive to prospective volunteers as well, as it was a more manageable proposition. And linking to this is creating subgroups of volunteers to look after different aspects. And this is, again, a great way of opening up more volunteering opportunities and spreading responsibility beyond the main committee. Um, and there's loads of different examples of this. So fundraising, marketing, events are all examples of areas that a group of people can take on and help attract new volunteers who have particular experience or interest in that subject especially those outside the club who might not necessarily have the rugby knowledge. So this is something that Artley have done really successfully, and I'll pass over to Paul in a bit to talk through that in a little bit more detail. But also just going back to the point that Rachel made earlier, and which came out again through the listing workshops, is people can say, well, I don't have that sport knowledge, or I don't know enough about rugby, and that's a barrier to getting involved. When actually thinking about it, some of the volunteer roles that, that probably most need fill in are those that are committee roles and those which often don't need that sport specific knowledge. So whether it's treasurer, whether it's marketing and digital, whether it's fundraising, and is some of that reflected in how you recruit volunteers? And then finally, when ensuring that you make volunteering that easy and attractive option, do you think about buddying up new volunteers with an existing volunteer? Um, and I know, again, that can be a challenge because existing volunteers have a lot going on already. But this doesn't have to be anything more than an informal catch up over the phone or over a coffee, but just helps to provide that supportive environment when somebody's first thinking about getting involved in volunteering. So that was an overview of the how to guides um, and how you can try and support a proactive approach in terms of volunteer recruitment. And we've pulled all of that together into an action plan and I'll just hand over to Alex to launch the final poll. Yep, final poll. Do you have a volunteer plan that should be with you now? Um, you know, is it yes? No, but we plan to develop one. 
uh, and no, and, and it's not not on our radar currently. Or is it something else, you know? And if it is, then let us know in the chat. There are some really great things coming out in the chat now. Certainly some examples we're starting to see about splitting roles, vice chairs, assistant secretaries, but, you know, also some noting that it's still challenging to do that um, as well is coming out as well in the chat there. Uh, just going to give you a final bit of time. Uh, this uh, uh, is the last poll, so get your answers in in now and i'm just going to end the poll there and share the results so there's not many actually with a volunteer plan um it's come out uh, no you know but there's quite a few that plan to develop one uh, but also quite a few that's not on their radar um so i'll stop sharing those results now steph brilliant thanks alex so for those that plan to develop one and maybe for those that um, is not currently on their radar, but after this webinar and after having a look at the toolkit, it might be something that is spoken about at the next committee meeting. We've pulled together um, a how to guide in terms of creating that action plan, which will hopefully help to make the volunteer experience more inclusive and welcoming and ultimately bring in some new volunteers to the club. And there's five steps that this um, goes through. So the first is around enlisting your volunteers. So that might just be worth having a conversation or a chat at the next committee meeting about actually how do we start to think about recruiting volunteers and take that proactive approach. The next one is around analysing your current situation. So before identifying what you might want to change, just having to think about the current situation. And this might be about what does that volunteer experience look like? So some things that you might want to consider are around inspiring. So we've talked about this, but how easy is it for people to find out information about volunteering? And is actually that quite a quick fix? Recruit, so where do we look for volunteers? Are there any skills or experience that you'd like to bring into the club? And hopefully some of the things we spoke about earlier in terms of different opportunities to advertise might be useful. Um, and then another one, amplify. So how do we tell people outside the club CV about volunteering and the opportunities available? In terms of understanding your local community, this will just help to see how representative your club and volunteer group is and help you potentially identify people that you might want to try and engage. The good news is that this work's already been done for you by the Office for National Statistics. So if you are interested in your local community and the demographics, We've got um, a link within the toolkit that signposts to this website, which Alex will also be able to pop into the chat now. And this isn't focused on ensuring that the demographics of your club or CV exactly match those of your local community, but just to have a think about whether there's different ways that you can reach out and engage with a wider audience beyond those that are already members of the club and involved. And then making your plan. So this obviously can include both short term and long term goals, and completely appreciating and remembering that not everything has to be tackled at once, but this could be some really simple, quick fixes um, that you can start to put into action. And then finally, communicating your plan. And this is perhaps a stage that gets forgotten about, but one of the most important. So once you've agreed the plan or some steps that you're going to put into place with regards to volunteer recruitment, communicate that back to all of your fellow, fellow volunteers and club members. Now, everyone knows what you're trying to do and why it's important you'll hopefully find they'll be a lot more supportive and they might even offer to get involved and help out. So having that clear purpose can really help when it comes to volunteer recruitment. And this is something that Otley have done really well. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Paul now to provide a bit of an update on how they've approached it and some further information um, on how they've gone about it. So, Paul, over to you. Thanks, Steph. First slide. Thank you. Uh, that all, probably all sounds really daunting to everybody. Um, I've been in chairman of Otley for about six or seven years. And when I first was asked to be chairman, the whole place was pretty chaotic. Um, need, something needed to be done. It was living by the day, not planning for the future, not even thinking about what was going to happen on a Saturday. So fairly quickly when I got involved, um, we started to create a vision that's a sort of a work in progress document. It moves all every time, it moves forward all the time. So it's 2025 at the moment, but it, five years, six years ago, it was 2023. Uh, really important to us. And this could be actually a volunteer plan, um, listening to what Steph and the guys have been saying. It, for us, it's a vision. Uh, we got all the members into the clubhouse and created seven pillars 
of what we thought were important to our club. This would be different to every other club, but ours were financial sponsorship relationships, rugby facilities, members and community. Very familiar words to you, but what was important to me was to say, what do we want to do with these seven pillars? And I think if you pick any one of those sort of five or six bullet points within any of those pillars, you can see, therefore, a volunteer role. And I'll pick one uh, typically in the first column, financials. The third one down says establish a new constitution fits for the 21st century. Well, five years after this was written this year, we have created a new constitution and we've got a charitable company a limited by guarantee application in with the charity commission with a whole new constitution that's been driven we wouldn't have been able to do that without coming up with the vision and moving things forward because it just got lost in the wire really it just get lost in everything else um, of running the day-to-day -day rugby club so my my view going back five or six years was create the vision and get members to buy into what that vision is. And then it becomes an updated document every year whereby things can change, things will come off the vision, things will move on the vision as your club develops. Um, if you go to the second side, slide, Seth, and I'll probably come back to this one, but the second slide was communication was absolutely critical. So, you know, creating subgroups, allocating a chair to that subgroup, and then identifying the individuals within those subgroups. But what we were doing, so if you go back to the previous slide, please, Steph, what was really important, example. yeah, what was really important to us was to tell people or to say to people, this is what we want to do. Can you help? So you can pick any one of those five um, strands underneath the seven pillars, and there's a volunteer role there. You know, you go to the last column, community, um, increased our mixed gender participation. So, you know, getting somebody to run a girls, uh, the, you know, to promote the girls activities in the junior rugby. You know, we've now got uh, 300 uh, kids playing rugby. A third of them are females. Seven years ago, we didn't have any. So, you know, it just but we've now got somebody running that. So we created our own volunteers by creating the actions, by creating this, this vision that actually created and identified what needed to be done. So you didn't get people just going off what we've the problem i found is we had a lot of willing volunteers operating in this chaotic environment all doing really valuable work but none of it joined up so actually we weren't making any progress and we only realized things were going wrong when things went wrong when you know things fell over why has that happened and everybody says well it's not my job it's not my job it's never anybody's job when it goes wrong so we were pretty clear on what uh, what we wanted people to do and to give them a long term goal so they could buy into this volunteer role. Um, we don't have enough volunteers. Um, we're a third of the way through creating this vision. And I'll probably say in the next three years, we'll probably be only 40 percent through it because it's work in progress all the time. It sits on our executive committee. Um, you know, and we discuss everything um, at most meetings, but only the really important things that are relevant for today. So if you go back to the second slide again, Steph, again, one of the new groups that we created, which sort of sits outside all the subgroups was what I'll call business and plan transformation and business planning. So we got a group of business people that were involved in the club that didn't really want to volunteer, but had a lot of good knowledge on how to run businesses. And we create and we, we created a platform on how do we transform our rugby club into something for the 21st century. And they overview everything that the subgroups do. So the subgroups report into a steering group and the steering group reports into the committee. So all the committee people that are doing the day to day work of running the club don't really get involved in any of this stuff. It's all done by 40 or 50 new volunteers that have come up with um, over the last um, three to four years. And it's quite powerful. Um, but the first stage, third slide, please, Steph, the, you know, quite importantly for us is first thing for us was to create a vision. But that could be a volunteer plan. Allocate subgroups on what's important to you as a club. And I allocate somebody that could organise that identify key individuals that have got the right skill set to contribute into that subgroup, whether it's financials, whether it's community, whether it's sponsorship, marketing, social media, rugby, whatever it is, but get key individuals that have got skill. Identify the objectives of those subgroups and give them a time scale that might be 18 months, so they've got time to operate within, and then give them authority to go deliver it. Um, make sure there's a mechanism for providing feedback and finally before it came back into the executive for sign off 
the steering group would provide us a checks and balance to make sure it was aligning to the vision. So the output and the outcome was more volunteers. The start of it wasn't to get more volunteers. It was to try and get an orderly rugby club and get out of the chaotic nature that we were in. The consequence was more volunteers. Um, so we found it quite a powerful tool, which we still use now to identify where we've got gaps. And if I say to you, um, our two biggest gaps are marketing and social media. So you can do this without having really key positions filled in. Our website's pretty hopeless. You won't find any material on our website that backs anything up that I'm telling you about. The vision's on there. Um, but it's all done by word of mouth, by talking to people, by gathering people in small groups and motivating them to, to go away and work within the group and to, and to try and do, you know, move the rugby club forward. So, you know, I think that's it, Steph, really, you know, just uh, happy to talk to anybody in the future about what we've done. You know, you can give me contact name and details out, no problem. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Paul. Really interesting to hear um, how you approach that. Um, and this information is captured in the action plan document as well with a case study. And I think, you know, to recruit 40 to 50 volunteers over the last couple of years is, is really impressive. So some great work. Um, so just going back to all of these resources, there are a number of case studies throughout each of them to bring to life some of the content that's been discussed. Um, and each of the resource is underpinned by some guidance on how to approach it and questions for you to consider as, as you go along. And we appreciate that, you know, there is a lot going on at the minute, but hopefully some of these are just some small things that you can consider, put into practice and will hopefully have some good results. So that's provided an overview of what's included in the volunteer recruitment toolkit and hopefully given some things to consider with regards to recruitment at your club or constituent body. And I think finally, just to bring us on to the final um, bit of the webinar is having heard all of this, it'd be really good if you could just put one action that you're going to take away from tonight's webinar into the chat. Now, this could be as simple as I'm going to go and have a look at the resources. It could be that I'm going to go and talk with a wider club committee about the volunteer recruitment, or it could be I'm going to go and have a look at the website and see how easy it is to find out about volunteer opportunities. Whatever that is, if you could put that in the chat, that would be brilliant. And I can see some of the chat coming through now. So whilst you're doing that, just as a final reminder, the resources that we've spoken about tonight are available on the diversity and inclusion hub of the website on the resources section. And they're also available on the volunteer recruitment page for people to access. And Alex will put links to both of those in the chat now. And you might also want to have a look at some of the resources on the Club Matters website as well. And we'll send around a link to all of this following tonight, along with a recording of the webinar so that that can be shared. Final um, plea from me, I guess, is we said at the start um, of the workshop that this toolkit is, is still the start of the process. And we'd really love to follow up with some of you who have attended tonight just to see how the resources have landed. So have you used them? What's worked well? Are there any areas for development? So if this is something that you would be happy to be involved with, if you could pop a quick note in the chat box along with your name and club, um, we will follow up with more details or alternatively, following this webinar, if you want to drop me a line and I'll put my email address in the chat in a bit, that would be really appreciated. So thank you very much for giving up your time to join us tonight. Before we finish, I will just pause to see if Alex has any questions from the chat for either myself, Paul or Rachel. Thanks. Uh... Uh, Steph, there's uh, a few things in the chat. I didn't see many questions, but I've picked up a few things. Firstly, for Paul, you know, lots of people saying inspiring, fantastic work, good effort, super interesting. Uh, so, you, you know, certainly Paul. So hence why, Paul, put yourself on camera, mate, because I've got a couple of questions for you um, that have come through. And I'd just like to get your opinion. So there was one on there that came through. You did. I saw you put your response in the chat, but how many uh, number of members do you have at Otley? We have about 300 members. That doesn't include junior kids. So including junior parents and um, members. So about 300. Um, so a pretty small club, really, compared to some of our, so, some of our um, sort of peer group in, the, in our local area. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. And uh, we had just some comments. So I'm going to ask your opinion, because obviously I think it fits in pretty well. So we had one that came in, say, 
You know, it's convincing the old school we need a plan. New school want one. So how did you go about that at uh, Artley? Uh, well, engaged with the old school really well. Most of our um, over 70s um, operate on a Wednesday gang, so they're all together every week. So right at the get-go, go tell, uh, go explain to them what needed to be done if they wanted to, if they wanted the rugby club to survive for another 150 years, and and get them bought into the to the vision, because they're they're as good at exporting the message as, as anybody. Um, so yeah, getting the old guard, getting the the long serving members um, on up to speed very quickly um, was one of the starting blocks. Excellent, thanks, Paul and Steph. Do you have anything to add on that in regard to convincing the the old school that we need a plan? I think sometimes it is just about sitting down and explaining. And I think Paul's probably covered that really well in terms of why why you're doing it and what those benefits are and what that means for the future of the club and the future of, of volunteering. And I think if you can have that open and honest conversation and provide that rationale and the benefits, then hopefully, you know, some of that will be taken on board and people will buy into that a little bit more. And, and sometimes it's just applying some of those small tricks or tips to see if it pays off. And if it does pay off, then that in itself is a reason to have a volunteer plan um, to, to think about it in more detail. Uh, one of the important things we also did, guys, was to, I mean, we, we were disconnected as a rugby club between our juniors and our seniors. Um, and analysing the situation three or four years ago, it was because of personalities. So unfortunately, we had to change people at the top of both organisations in order to become connected. Um, so, you know, now got a new set of junior uh, junior committee running the juniors that are fully engaged with what we're calling is our one club, uh, where we're all talking together. We're all on the same plan, talking the same language, walking the same walk, talking the same talk. Um, you know, so some difficult conversations ha are needed to be have if you've got blockages. Excellent. Excellent. That's uh, very useful. Steph, uh, you know, so we can see all your lovely faces do you want to stop sharing uh just while we take these questions yeah. at the end um brilliant so there was another one that came in there it wasn't a question but a, a sort of comment and be interested to get your thoughts on it and paul i'm going to come to you first again but uh, this is about it's hard to get people on cpd courses you know and there's sort of a mixture around that rachel was sort of clarifying you know is uh, and it said it was all of it. The funds, limited places, and they don't want to do it. How do you find that at your club, Paul? <laughs> Very difficult. I mean, we do bring people into the rugby club, which is easier because it's easy to get people down for a pint and do a bit of professional development with a beer in the hand. Um, it's very difficult, very challenging. People's time's precious. Um, we pick and choose where we think we want people to develop um, on, in which areas. Um, you know, the key things for us over the last five years have been around um, sort of commercial activities, making sure that, you know, avenues into our community. So we, we've engaged with our local business groups where we do, um, we get them to come and talk to us. Our mental health side, we go out to our local mental health charity, get them to come and talk to us about, you know, um, keeping our players up to speed on mental health issues. So it's very difficult getting people down. We find it easier to get people to the club so they can have a beer at the same time. Okay, so the social aspect is pretty pretty important then, Paul. It's it's essential. You know, we've got to try, but we're just, you know, we are a social community rugby club and you know, trying to break it out of what can be a fairly business-like environment in some stuff is, you know, puts people off. So we try to make it as relaxed as possible. When we were developing the vision and putting all the plans together, you know, they were all down at the club, the bar was open, getting people as almost like a social event, getting people writing down things on walls and boards and getting out every, ideas from everybody. So making it feel as though it was like a family gathering excellent thanks paul and we're coming to the to the end now um uh, rachel do you have anything to add on that on the cpd courses anything from your wider work that you've done um good question i think i think it is just about and and you you all know this and this is to really support um support paul's point um because i i know that you're all volunteers who put in a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort and sometimes it can feel like it's a job and you you've almost got to put yourself take yourself out of that headspace and put yourself in some in someone else's shoes and go you know what 
they also don't want to feel like volunteering is a job. They might not want to have to come and do all these courses all the time. So I think that um, trying to make things fun for people um, as highlighted, you know, making it more of a get together, also recognizing that some people might just want to come and help out and do, you know, their bit and that's okay for them. Um, and you might need to give them that flexibility um, versus kind of forcing them down um, a specific path. Um, that kind of flexibility is, is maybe how you keep people involved um, over the longer term. You know, so trying to, to make sure that the volunteering you offer also fits for them as well as fits for you. Thank you, Rachel. I were just past eight o'clock now so I'm going to pass back to Steph. Thanks Alex just to say a massive thank you everybody for joining us tonight we really do appreciate it as I know it is a busy time so we will send out um, a copy of the recording after this um, and if anyone does have any questions um, my email address will be included there so please do feel free to get in touch but otherwise have a great evening thank you very much everyone. <laughs>